Can you well? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as I said, my, my, as Oscar said, my name is Andre Faron. First of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, speak here today. Today, I'll give an uh, overview of our work on developing nanophotonic devices in uh, radar doped um, uh, crystals. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the people in my group who uh, contributed mostly to this uh, research, namely Dr. Uh, Tian Zong and uh, graduate students Evan Miazono, John Kingdom, Jake Rockman, Joanna Kraichu, and Dr. John Bartolomeo, also undergraduate uh, Daniel Luki and Raymond Lopez, and also some of our uh, funding sources. Uh, this talk is organized as follows. First, I will, will give you a uh, motivation, so an overview of uh, what, what is the big picture of what we want to do with these devices, and then I'll uh, go over the device uh, uh, fabrication, and then I will also show you some of the physics or some of the quantum technologies that we can um, do using these uh, devices. So I'm part of uh, a community of people who want to build uh, quantum machines. And generally, these uh, quantum machines are actually made out of uh, devices that we call qubits. These are like the transistors in a, a optical, uh, in a, a regular uh, computer. And uh, these qubits uh, interact, and basically we can uh, realize uh, quantum gates. Now, uh, these devices also have uh, what we call quantum memories, which will be similar to the RAM that you have on a, a regular uh, computer. And we're also dreaming about making these quantum machines and interconnecting them uh, with each other via optical channels in the same way you have uh, computers interconnected via optical fibers over the uh, internet. As I said, there is a relatively big community working on developing these ty uh, types of uh, machines. And uh, in particular, my group is, inter is uh, interested in how do we make uh, connections between uh, uh, between these machines using a light, how do you take qubits and quantum memories and interconnect them via uh, optical uh, channels? So uh, the reason why we uh, like to do this is because light is the best medium for uh, communication. So we like to interconnect matter to light, and that's why we say that we want to develop quantum light matter uh, interfaces. Uh, this type of uh, devices have been uh, proposed by uh, several people, including Professor Jeff Kimball uh, here at Caltech. And uh, this is a picture from one of his review papers in uh, 2008. And basically the idea is that if you have uh, uh, single atoms, the single atoms can occupy some specific uh, uh, quantum states. And uh, use, by coupling these atoms to an optical cavity, in this case, you know, it's basically two mirrors sitting in front of each other that enhance the interaction between the atom with light. You can actually transfer the quantum state from one atom to uh, the other. Another type of like, uh, light matter interface is a quantum memory. For example, this, you can uh, envision an ensemble of atom. And if you, you can have light that is actually stored in an ensemble of atom, and then it, there are um, there are def different protocols, so you can actually retrieve this light on demand while preserving its uh, quantumness. Uh, in general, when we uh, work with, we develop these devices, we like to uh, use atoms that are more friendly to us. So we, we like to have these uh, atoms that have this type of quantum level structure, generally where you can have, you can isolate three levels, like a lambda uh, system. and. Uh, uh, we generally we encode the quantum state in the superposition of these two levels, A and B, and then we optically manipulate via transitions through the uh, this, uh, excited states. Uh, more recently, our community has been interested in actually how do we couple uh, this type of uh, atomic ensembles to, uh, to superconducting devices, because one of the most promising technologies to make uh, super, uh, uh, quantum computing machines is based on uh, a superconducting qubit, and now there is a question, how do you actually interface this with uh, light? Uh, this type of devices uh, were proposed initially in the context of atomic physics. However, we are interested in developing them in, in toy states. So instead of having single atoms or like single trapped ions that are coupled to optical resonators, uh, with microscopic optical resonators, we would like to make devices of uh, this kind where the optical resonator is made out of a solid state uh, material. In this case, it's a photonic crystal resonator fabricated in one of these uh, complex uh, oxides, in this case, yttrium ortho uh, silicate. 
and the atoms are actually sitting in, embedded inside this uh, optical uh, resonator, and the atoms here are just shown uh, schematically. So uh, the atoms that we use uh, in our group are lanthanide atoms, and uh, the lanthanides are all these elements in, in uh, the periodic uh, table. In particular, we are working with uh, neodymium and uh, erbium, and also more recently with uh, uh, ytterbium. Uh, and they can be incorporated in materials like uh, yttrium ortosilicate, uh, yttrium ortovanadate, or uh, YAG. These materials are actually quite, are quite common in the uh, optical uh, community. They are widely used for making various lasers. So there has been like there is a, a large amount of research of uh, in, in laser uh, laser materials based on this uh, uh, type of uh, dopants. Now, why are lanthanides special for quantum optics, for quantum applications? The reason is that they start with a, a xenon core followed, followed by a 4F orbital, which is not completely filled, followed by 5S and a 5P uh, orbital. Now, uh, in, in, if you put this atom in a crystal, uh, the, uh, you can have optical transitions within the uh, 4F orbital. And uh, these transitions are actually very highly coherent and also interact mainly with light. And that's why these materials are very good for uh, lasing materials. From, uh, for quantum optics, these are very good because the 5S and 5P orbitals actually shield the, the 4F orbital. And basically, the, this 4F electrons kind of sit like in a Faraday cage uh, that's just, just such that they are isolated from the uh, environment and you can preserve they're like quantumness, that's their quantum states for uh, a longer time. Um, so these are our atoms that we use. If, we, if you think about the, what is the level structure of these atoms, uh, basically they have uh, states, like uh, this one are the 4F states, like Z1, Y1. When you place them in a crystal, this, uh, um, this state split into, uh, the, the crystal field splitting and the spacing is on the order of uh, uh, terahertz, like in the case about 10 nanometer. Here I show you the example of erbium, but uh, the level structure is very similar for other materials like uh, neodymium, <coughs> ytterbium, prosthodymium. Uh, if you apply a magnetic field, uh, this level splits into two, two, two Zeeman, uh, Zeeman states similar to an uh, atom. Uh, if you have an isotope that is, has nuclear spin, you can have hyperfine splitting. For example, in erbium, uh, each one of these levels is, play, is, uh, is split into eight uh, hyperfine states. And if you apply another magnetic field, you can actually split this to uh, hyperfine manifolds into two uh, uh, Zeeman manifolds. So, uh, so this is the typical uh, level structure. And uh, we have, uh, these materials have been used uh, quite a lot in, in the quantum memory community. This is just a laundry list of uh, uh, what has been achieved so far with using bulk laser crystals uh, in, mem uh, in the quantum memory community. Uh, there's been impressive results of storing quantum states with more than, with about 70% efficiency. People have been able to store uh, quantum uh, entanglement. Also, there's been progress on actually detecting even a single, uh, a single lanthanide atoms in, the, in uh, crystals. Uh, our vision is actually to build up on the work done in quantum memory community. So, for example, this is a uh, microscopic uh, quantum memory uh, done in a crystal, which is about uh, centimeters long. So we want to build up on expertise in superconducting devices with the scope of making on-chip micro nanoscale devices uh, to, that can be integrated in on-chip uh, quantum networks. So I mentioned briefly the Applications are on-chip optical quantum memories. Single error times can be used like as a quantum bits in this uh, quantum machines. Also are interested in devices for transduction between microwave and optical fields. And uh, also there is a very rich playground for uh, fundamental physics. Now, what is the reason for going to uh, nanoscale? So to make like on-chip nanoscale devices. The reason is that uh, it, uh, it enhances the interaction of, of light with uh, matter. So if you think of an atom sitting in free space, usually if you interact with a photon, usually uh, nothing happens. But uh, if you place this uh, atom between two mirrors, like in an optical resonator, then the photon gets trapped between two mirrors and it gives the uh, atom time to, uh, uh, to interact with it. And so this is what we call an optical resonator, and we like the, the light to stay 
in an optical resonator for as long as possible. So we talk about quality factor, which is proportional to the number of op optical periods that lie space in the resonator. Also, it has adv advantages for this resonator to be uh, as small as possible because we operate to the level where we have single photons interacting with single uh, atoms. So if you think of the, uh, if a single photon which is confined in a smaller and smaller plate, basically that the electric field that corresponds to a single photon is, is higher and uh, this uh, increases the uh, in interaction between uh, that single photon and the atom. Uh, now if you have this rare earth ions, this lanthanides in nano cavities, the, uh, uh, the, the figure of merit is what we call cooperativity, which is the ratio of the coupling rate between the atom uh, and the cavity and the decay rate. Uh, kappa is the cavity decay rate and gamma is the uh, atomic decay rate into uh, uh, other channels. And uh, basically, uh, even for lanthanide atoms, we can achieve this cooperativity factor to be greater than one for nanophotonic devices where the ratio of the quality factor over the mole volume is on the order of a few uh, thousand. So these are uh, uh, um, parameters that we actually can achieve commonly in nanophotonics uh, uh, these days. Now if you have a, uh, to understand what actually it means to have a cooperativity greater than one, if you have like a single uh, neodymium atom, for example, coupled to a nanophotonic cavity and you have a laser beam that you scan through this uh, uh, cavity. If you um, scan your laser, uh, you see the, the cavity shape, and here in, in the middle, you, the transmission gets blocked even from uh, a, a single uh, atom. This is the signature that you're in a, a high cooperativity regime. And actually, it means that most of the interaction between the atoms uh, and the uh, photons are, are actually mediated by this uh, single atom in, uh, in the cavity. Okay, so this is the, uh, the motivation, this is why, what we want to do. And now let me show you the devices that uh, enable us to uh, do this uh, type of uh, um, uh, experiments. So we fabricate these nanophotonic cavities in materials uh, as the yttrium orthosilicate or yttrium orthovanadate. And this is an example of uh, uh, one of the earlier devices that uh, we have uh, uh, fabricated basically. It's a nano beam, a photonic crystal cavity. It actually has this uh, uh, triangular uh, profile. It actually looks like a, a Toblerone bar, but the cuts are made from this uh, other, uh, other end. And uh, basically, the, this, uh, uh, this cuts that we made in this nano beam actually uh, act as the photonic crystal uh, uh, mirror. The photonic crystal is the what confines the light. And here at the center, actually, we change the uh, periodicity of the photonic crystal that allows us to make an optical uh, cavity. Uh, here at the end, there actually, we, we also mill with focused ion beam milling two uh, uh, tr uh, trenches. And uh, these are the 45 degrees, which allow us to actually uh, uh, couple light in, and light gets reflected into the device. It interacts with the uh, atoms that act as, for example, a quantum memory, and then we can collect light from this uh, other side. Uh, this is a, a slide showing the fabrication process. In this case, we use uh, focused uh, uh, ion beam uh, milling because actually we are working in a, in a bulk crystal, so we don't have a, a, a membrane that allows us to, uh, um, to, to make devices in the same way you can uh, do it on a silicon on uh, insulator. So first we use the focused ion beam to define this triangular uh, profile for the, uh, for the nano beam. Then uh, we rotate the sample and from the top we come and make these uh, cuts into the nano beam. And at the end we also make these 45 degree cuts at the uh, end of the nano beam that allow us to, to couple light in via total uh, internal uh, re re reflection. Uh, this shows some of the devices that uh, we made, so we can make devices for different wavelengths. For example, we can work with neodymium at 880 nanometer, with erbium at 1550 nanometers, at uh, europium at 580 nanometers. So basically, all these uh, devices see there, uh, basically they, they are pro their dimension is, is proportional to, uh, uh, to the wavelength. Uh, now when we uh, probe these devices, they uh, usually sit at cold temperature in a, uh, in a, um, 
in a cryostat, in this case it's a tabletop uh, cryostat, and we use optics to actually uh, uh, couple light in from one end of the device and then the light comes out from the other end of the device. And if you put it on a spectrometer, you see this uh, type of spectra, which is uh, the, uh, basically the optical resonance of the uh, device. Um, these are some data that we obtained from this uh, yttrium orthosilicate uh, devices. Uh, basically, this is, uh, these are the modes of uh, this uh, um, uh, resonators, and uh, here uh, it's a typical uh, resonance that we measure at uh, this is telecom wavelengths for uh, erbium uh, uh, for de devices designed to work with erbium, and uh, the quality factor that we measure for erbium is on the order of uh, 30,000. For neodymium, we measured about uh, uh, 10,000, and for europium at a shorter wavelength, about uh, 3,000. In this, uh, so yttrium orthosilicate is this uh, complex oxide which has an index of refraction about uh, 1.8. Another uh, complex oxide is this yttrium orthovanadate. It has an index of refraction of 2.2. Here we can make similar devices, but uh, the quality factor is a bit higher on the order of uh, 20,000 uh, for neodymium wavelength at around uh, 870 nanometers because uh, this material has a slightly re higher refractive index um, than uh, uh, yttrium orthosilicate. So the past year we've been uh, playing around trying to actually uh, etch this uh, complex oxides into uh, with, with using RIE, but fortunately it's not with, uh, they, they don't get etched very well by almost uh, anything. You, you, you can, uh, you, the, the most effective one is just uh, argon milling uh, basically, and uh, so we haven't been very successful in, in actually uh, uh, patterning uh, or, or etching uh, these um, uh, devices in, uh, uh, in an RIE. Uh, we have some success actually with uh, wet etching, and these are some uh, just preliminary results. What you can do, you can take one of these chips and, and uh, bombard it with uh, helium. Uh, this is 90 kV uh, helium, and what it does, it basically up, uh, it makes an amorphous region uh, under the surface of the uh, yttrium or OSO uh, crystal. And uh, then we have discovered that actually if we place it into uh, HCL, we can actually undercut this uh, membranes. And these are some uh, devices where we, uh, so first we, we implanted uh, helium and then we uh, made some cuts using the uh, focused uh, ion beam uh, milling and then we uh, placed these uh, devices into uh, HCL and uh, we observed this, uh, this uh, undercut. Uh, so currently we're trying to uh, further explore the capabilities of, of this uh, technique for making on-chip devices. Maybe we can release like larger membranes from this uh, chip and maybe place it on a different substrate where we can do uh, subsequent fabrication. One difficulty uh, with this technique is because since this material YSO is, is not uh, isotropic, when actually when, when you etch it with uh, uh, HCL, the etch is uh, not uh, uh, is, is not isotropic, and basically you end up having uh, uh, facets at uh, at uh, crystal uh, angles, which is not ideal um, uh, uh, in, in in most uh, circumstances. Uh, how much time do I have left? I have <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, okay. So these are the devices that uh, that uh, we, we work with. Now let me show you what what we can do with them. So the first application that we are targeting, were, uh, we, we targeted our, our uh, optical um, quantum memories, and for this uh, uh, type of uh, experiments, we've actually placed this uh, device into a dilution refrigerator. Actually, we have a microscope objective that focuses light at the end of the device, and then we, we collect light from the same uh, input port. This is a special design that we do here to, so that, that, such that our devices actually are impedance matched only at the, uh, with the uh, input port, this, input, uh, this port, so there is not much coupling to this uh, other port. When we measure these devices, this is what we see. So 
This is a reflection measurement. Basically, we see this uh, drop uh, due to uh, the cavity resonance. And here at the uh, resonance, you also see this peak. And this peak is because of the coherent interaction between the uh, neodymium uh, atoms and the uh, cavity field. Uh, so this is from this port. If you look from this port, you just see flat because there is no, uh, there is not much coupling through uh, this mirror. Uh, when we uh, measure these devices, the first thing that we are looking for is for uh, coupling. And uh, uh, when the atoms are coupled, so these atoms that are here are coupled to the, the cavity, actually they are supposed to emit uh, light at faster rates. And uh, this is the measurement that we do. Basically, we send a laser pulse and we look at how the atoms decay. And we see that while the atoms in bulk decay about 90 microseconds lifetime in uh, these devices, they are much shorter at 4.5 uh, microseconds, uh, one over E time. Uh, another measurement that we do is to, to characterize the optical coherence and make sure that the nanofabrication process de doesn't degrade the optical coherence. This is very important for us. And basically, while in bulk we have 3.2 microseconds optical coherence in these cavities, uh, the um, T2 is on the order of uh, 3.1 microseconds. When you tune it to ions on resonance, the T2 becomes actually somewhat shorter because uh, it becomes uh, T1 uh, limited. So in these devices, we apply what is called the atomic frequency comp quantum memory protocol. So we have a distribution of atoms that all have different uh, frequencies. So it's a, it's a, it's a, the assembly is inhomogeneously broadened. And basically, we uh, take our laser and apply it at uh, even uh, I frequency intervals. And basically, we pump the atoms from this ground state into this auxiliary Zeeman state. And now, if you absorb, so this is the absorption profile that we create. And now, if you absorb one photon, we can uh, release it back. Actually, that's because this uh, type of structure rephases uh, with uh, itself at uh, 1 over delta, where delta is the spacing between these uh, teeth. Um, so, uh, to uh, first, we need to create this uh, atomic frequency comp. And so basically, this is the level structure in, uh, of the, our atoms in the cavity. Then we actually apply a laser beam within this uh, inhomogeneous uh, uh, broadened uh, ensemble. And so we pump it. Uh, and then first, we, uh, so we pump the, um, uh, the, the atoms. And then we wait for some time. And then we probe them with a laser, fi with, with a laser pulse. And first thing, we want to make sure that uh, we still have a long Zeeman lifetime. And basically, we probe with uh, the, we, we, ch we, we change the waiting time. So we pump, and then we change the waiting time, and then we probe with a laser pulse. And actually, we measure how much population we have remaining into our Zeeman lifetime. And we observe that both in the cavity and bulk, it is on the order of 12 uh, milliseconds. The other measurement that we do is how long does it take for us to actually pump these uh, atoms into the Zeeman state. And we measure that actually in the uh, cavity, the pump time is actually much shorter than uh, in bulk, which is what we expect and also one of the advantages of, for using these uh, devices. Uh, as I said, we, uh, we create atomic frequency comps in these devices. So we pump these atoms into this state. And basically, this is the absorption profile that we create in these uh, devices. So this is the, the comb. And then we, we take a photon, we absorb it, and then we re uh, re it gets released at 1 over uh, delta, where delta is the spacing between the comb. And this is the data showing that we can indeed send a, a photon pulse in, and then it uh, uh, rephases back after 75 uh, nanoseconds. We can also uh, store uh, photon pulses. Basically, if you take two pulses, one after the other, we can uh, store both of them and then get uh, they rephase back with a fidelity greater than uh, 95%. Um, I'm going to skip over these slides because it's a bit too, too technical. So that type of device that we uh, developed were, the, was, were for uh, erbium. So this is erbium in yttrium orthosilicate. Uh, first, we uh, experimented with devices uh, that are uh, made with also with focused uh, uh, ion beam milling. Again, we can uh, make uh, resonators. And also, you observe uh, a coupling of uh, this is the uh, erbium transition to this uh, uh, cavity. And we also measure that uh, 
the lifetime of the erbium atoms in also get uh, shortened uh, inside the cavity, which is a sign of coupling. Another way to fabricate devices for erbium, uh, that, uh, so the main advantage of erbium is that it operates at telecom wavelength, is via this uh, hybrid uh, techniques. Basically, first we deposit a layer of amorphous uh, uh, silicon on this uh, ethium ortosilicate substrate, then we pattern using electron beam bridges, uh, the photonic uh, device, and then use plasma etching to, to etch uh, into the amorphous uh, uh, silicon. These are some of the devices that we have fabricated. Basically, these are rings uh, made out of uh, amorphous silicon, and these are uh, waveguide and, and uh, uh, graphene couplers that allow us to couple light in and out of uh, these devices. This is a typical device with a quality factor greater than 100,000, and this dip here is due to the uh, uh, coupling to the erbium atoms. Currently, this is uh, the technique that we are most uh, uh, enthusiastic for, for the future because it really allows us to, to make large-scale uh, devices. And uh, uh, so this, uh, this is done with uh, amorphous silicon. However, we're moving to a technique right now where, where we have uh, crystalline silicon membranes, so we exfoliate from a, a SOI wafer and we transfer on our yttrium orthosilicates or yttrium orthovanadate substrate, and then we do all the fabrication uh, uh, process on the uh, crystalline uh, membrane. And uh, the, this process is also very uh, versatile. We can transfer it to any other material that can, uh, can be in a membrane form like gallium arsenide or gallium phosphide. Uh, with this, I will conclude. So uh, again, I'd like to acknowledge again my, my group and the funding sources. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Any quick questions for, uh, OK. Yeah, so in our case, uh, we have this uh, 45 degree couplers that allow us to couple into the device via total internal reflection. A typical uh, insertion loss, so the coupling rate is about 30%, so we can lose about 70% in, in back reflection. You have to remember that we have like an interface between uh, air and the uh, yttrium orthosilicate or yttrium orthovanadate, so you, you have also reflection from the um, uh, from the just the input facet. Uh, so for, for nanophotonic platform, this is a decent uh, coupling. We, if we could experiment with uh, some anti-reflection coatings to actually improve uh, this, uh, this, this coupling rate, but so far it has been uh, just good enough for, for our experiment. And, uh, and the, uh, inside the cavity, basically the, 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 the loss rate is given by the uh, basic just the, the quality factor. Does this answer your question? Uh, well, we have light leak from the uh, from from us. For example, in the oscillator, with the light uh, propagating, where 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 is the light leak from the top direction? Yes. So that, that that that's what I'm saying. That loss direction, that that loss in that direction is basically uh, given by the uh, quality factor. So the quality factor includes both the coupling loss into the mirror and also in the. Uh, outward direction. For right now, actually, the, the, for this one-sided cavities that where we, we design one strong mirror and one, one short mirror, the, the loss in, in upward and the loss into the input channel is actually equal. Okay. Yeah. How about we actually, our devices are much more reflective than gold, so uh, gold will actually be even more lo uh, uh, lossy, so because it has uh, up, up, it, even though it is reflective, I mean the, refle the reflection coefficient, the, the, uh, the absorption, the, the reflection coefficient is about 90 
uh, I don't know, like 98% of, of for gold or something like that. So you have a few percent of uh, actually uh, loss, and that loss will be like too much for for, for us. Yeah. Matt, do you have a short question? Yes, yes, we, 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 we thought about that and we're actually quite excited about uh, the, the new uh, tool. And uh, um, there are, currently there is a system with some inertia because we have devices that uh, are already working with uh, uh, this old uh, FIB tool. And what happens is that we also have a, a wet etching. So we, we do a little bit of uh, wet etching after we do the FIB that I think it's, it's removing some of the uh, damaged uh, uh, region. So, so far, we don't see uh, big uh, degradation due to the gallium. Uh, but definitely, the new tool with, uh, with neon and also with helium, uh, I think, should give us a much better uh, performance. We just we have to go on to the learning curve and, and uh, uh, learn how to make these devices on the new tool. OK, well, we need to move on. Thank, thanks, Andre. Our next speaker is uh, Thomas Miller, and we heard about